learning. Thanks very much, Emma. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks, everyone, for staying till the end. I know I'm getting to the end of a wonderful day. Um, I'd love, feel free to interrupt me with questions during this if there's anything burning. Otherwise, we can wait till the very um, end. So before I get started, I just want to say thank you to my lab. Um, they're really the wonderful people behind my work, um, and I, I, it's really a pleasure to get to interact with all of them. I'm curious, who here has heard about AlphaGo? I'm sort of in a bubble, but not everyone <laughs> is in the same bubble as me. Okay, great, so for, raise your hand if you have not heard of this. A lot of people have, but a lot of people haven't. Okay, so there's been some really exciting work that's been happening in reinforcement learning. I'll define what that is in just a second. Um, AlphaGo is a computer program that can play the board game Go. It can also play the board game Chess. <laughs> it can also play a number of other board games. And it's had a lot of um, really amazing successes recently in that it is now a essentially the best player in the world. So it is better than the best people, um, and this is a very major milestone because people thought that Go, which is considered an extremely challenging board game, um, was not going to be solved for probably just another five or ten years, um, but it was solved a few years ago. So in some ways, if you look at this picture, um, AlphaGo has beaten <laughs> the person on the left. Um, it, it has triumphed. But I remain putting all of my bets on, on the person on the left. Um, and the reason for this is that for the last 50 years, when we think about AI, when we also think about this new data science thing, um, there's sort of been two opposing realities. One is AI and data science to sort of replace people, and another is a view of AI and data science to augment people. And I think if we think about all the amazing things that the person on the left can do, it far outstrips what any computer science program is capable of right now. So I think that humans are incredible. I think that, um, I, that the potential of AI to augment them is particularly exciting. And I would argue that we could benefit from some augmentation. So if you think about the amazing number of decisions we have to make every day, some of them are minor. There was this nice study I saw recently that said that we forget 200 of the minor nutritional decisions we make each day. So those are the decisions we don't even realize we're making. We think about perhaps the more major decisions, which is the fact that we might be changing jobs every few years and doing massive amounts of retraining. Maybe many of you in the room are in the process of becoming data scientists yourself. And then, at least in my area, we think about the massive amount of research that is coming out all the time um, and doubling, the output per year is doubling every nine years and trying to stay on top of all of that forms of information. And so I think a lot about how we can have computers that learn to help us. How can we have computers that allow us to make better decisions um, because they can help us with this sort of enormous complexity that is increasing all the time? Now, when we think about what it might mean for a computer to help us, I think we naturally need to think about optimization and we naturally need to think about uncertainty. We need to have computers that can understand intent. We need to have computers that can reason about their own limitations and their ability to help us. And so when I think about this formally in terms of like a mathematical perspective, um, I think about reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, as a cartoon, we could think about a computer that is trying to help us. And it tries to do something perhaps maybe useful, maybe giving a doctor a recommendation. Um, and then it can observe how that help changed the state of the world. And maybe it also gets some information of some sort of reward signal about whether or not that actually was a useful thing to do. And then we repeat. So it's this beautiful closed loop cycle of trying to do things, sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing, and trying again. And in fact, that's what we heard about a lot in the last panel, is thinking about us as human agents trying to do this. And I think a lot about how we have computer agents do the same thing. So this is generally the instance of reinforcement learning, agents that are learning to make good decisions when it doesn't know what the uh, result of those decisions might be. Now, in my lab, I think about this in particular for when reinforcement learning agents are trying to help people. I think about education, I think about training, I think about healthcare. So um, I'm really fortunate to get to come after all of the amazing speakers and panelists that we've just been seeing. Now, what I'm going to talk about today just briefly is counterfactual reasoning, because I think it's incredibly important, um, and I think it's something that's going to continue to be important going forward. So I first started thinking about this problem about five years ago. I was collaborating with some colleagues up at University of Washington, and they had this game called Refraction. Refraction has been played by approximately 500,000 students, um, and it teaches kids about fractions by having them feed spaceships by splitting laser beams. So 
the natural question when students are doing this is that this is an optional learning activity. And what we wanted to figure out how to do is how to help people play for longer, how they could persist in this activity. This again bridges back to the conversations we were just having about how can we help people succeed in the face of adversity. So we really wanted to figure out how to sort of adaptively give people educational experiences in order to help them persist and learn most effectively. And the challenge was this might vary for individuals and, and how could we use previous data to try to make, this, uh, make these decisions. So in particular, um, if we think about what a decision policy would be here, it's some mapping for how the student is doing to what level to give next to the student or what next activity to give to the student. And the question is how we can use our old data to try to make better decision policies. Decision policies or strategies for teaching that are gonna help people persist for longer. Now, it turns out that this isn't just a problem that comes up in education, it comes up all over the place. It comes up in healthcare for things like how do we estimate the treatment effect of different types of interventions. In my case, I was thinking about not just single treatments, but sequences of interventions. So we want to think about not just what to do for a patient or a student now, but across time in order to maximize outcomes. So another place that we see this in things like scheduling, and it turns out that this is a pretty hard problem. And it's a pretty hard problem for the reason of censored data, which is that you only get to experience one life. You only get to experience your life going forward knowing that you went to the WIDS conference today. <laughs> you never get to experience what it would have been like if you had watched Netflix. So um, we have this problem that for any individual, any data set, we only get to see the action that was taken or the treatment that was made. And yet we want to do this fundamental counterfactual reasoning about what would have happened if we were to treat a patient differently, if we were to teach a student differently. And there's a beautiful talk by Judea Pearl um, where he argues that this is really one of the essential aspects of human intelligence, our ability to imagine what would have been in another life. It also is a challenging problem because if you think about these sequences of interventions, we don't want to try all of these combinatorially. I don't want to think about level 1, level 13, level 27, level 5, 17. I want to think about sort of being able to generalize what things are going to actually be effective um, in a way so that I don't have to run a you know, combinatorial number of different experiments. So what was it like in this particular data set? Well, in this particular data set, we had access to about 11,000 students' data. Um, and what we wanted to ma maximize, again, was persistence, essentially just the number of levels the student completed. Now, what do we do? Um, well, we started and we thought, let's be a good machine learning and data science person, and let's build a predictive model, a predictive model of student play. And so we took our 11,000 data points and tried to predict a model um, that would allow us to simulate how users might do. So if we have a simulator, if we have essentially this fake student that we've um, built during, using our previous data, then now we can do optimization for that fake student. We can figure out what would be the most effective policy for that fake student um, that then maybe we'll deploy in the future. So as you might imagine, there might be some flaws to this. One problem you might uh, realize is that um, if that model is not very good, then maybe the policy, the decision policy we get out might also not be very good. So if we've got a bad fake student, then however we're best trying to teach that fake student might not transfer to the real world very well. So that's quite natural. We might expect that if we have bad predictive models, they're gonna be bad for making decisions. The surprising thing we found is that in fact, um, it can be worse than that. And in particular, what this graph is showing is it's showing the difference between predictive performance, which is so shown in gray, and best decision policy performance, which is shown in black. And the x-axis here is essentially showing different levels of representations of students. Now, the key idea here is that um, the best predictive model may not be the best model that you want to use when you're actually making decisions. This is particularly important if your models are not fully expressive. And so when we saw this, we thought, well, maybe we need to do something differently. And so one of the reasons that this issue can happen is that if your models aren't very good, if the class of models you're fitting aren't very good, then even if you have lots of data, you might end up making bad decisions if you assume those models are right. So what we ended up doing is using a different technique for, that many of you might have heard of before, which is called important sampling. Um, it's a way to sort of statistically unbiased correct for sort of distributions of data that look different, so you can estimate how different decision policies might do. Yeah. 
Now, when we did this, that allowed us to think about lots of different ways of teaching students. So you don't need to look at the x-axis here, you just need to see that we tried lots of different ways that we might be able to teach students, and we estimated how good they would be using our old data. So we were encouraged, we saw in green here, that one of them we thought we could increase persistence by 30%. Now I just wanna highlight this thing that's under zero. So zero here is random. That means that if we just randomly you know, show levels to students, how long will they play for? And this red bar was expert. So that means that our expert performance was worse than if we just randomly showed levels to people. This expert was designed by like video game instructors. Um, and obviously this is a little bit embarrassing because it is worse than random. But the thing that I think this highlights is that in some of these cases, it's really hard to know what are good decision policies, what will help patients, what will help students. And that's exactly where data science and artificial intelligence might be able to be helpful. Okay, so that was predicted improvement. That was on our previous data set of those roughly 11,000 students. We wanna see if that's actually true. So what we did is we tried four policies with 500 new learners each. Um, and we all, uh, wanted to see what the real improvement was. So remember what we predicted there is that we'd be 30% better. And in reality, we were 32%. So we were super excited when we saw this because it meant that we really had uncovered a way that was much more effective for helping students persist in this game. And equally importantly, we could predict this before we actually tried it out. And I think that's super critical. When I talk to some industry, I'd love to talk to some of you more about this. When I talk to some people in industry, one question about reinforcement learning methods is they want to know that it works before you deploy stuff. And if we are going to do that, we need to be able to do this sort of counterfactual reasoning to be able to make really good predictions about how much better new strategies might be before we unleash them in the wild. So I'll just say really briefly that this is certainly not the end of the story. There's a lot of other really exciting methods that combine between sort of building predictive models and this sort of important sampling techniques. Um, doubly robust statistical estimators is one direction for this. And we recently introduced a method that kind of combines these two, still is asymptotically unbiased, um, and has some nice properties. So this is a small domain, but I wanna highlight here is that um, we're getting orders of magnitude better estimates but perhaps more importantly, it means that we're gonna need an order of magnitude less data to get accurate estimates. Why is this important? Because we don't always get big data. In some cases, there are some conditions that there are not a lot of people. There are some new tutoring systems for which we don't have a lot of data either. And we would still like to be able to make effective strategies and good decisions in those cases, even in the small data regime. And so we need to have good mathematical techniques to allow us to tackle those problems. Now, I mentioned before that we sort of started off and thought we'd build these beautiful predictive models and then we were finding they didn't work very well. And so we went on this sort of other adventure where we looked at these other types of statistics to try to tackle this problem. But of course, recently there's been a lot of really exciting work in deep, uh, deep learning and we started thinking about the fact that often empirically we were seeing that the models were pretty good even though they might be biased. So what we were thinking is, well, maybe our models aren't so bad. Maybe the previous models we were using just were sort of from the wrong class. We were using the wrong type of models and we we're using the wrong way to fit them. So the insight we had in that case is that maybe we could combine sort of deep learning models, really powerful models, with a new type of loss function, a counterfactual loss function that was gonna directly try to get us models that were gonna be good for predicting if we wanted to make different types of decisions. So this is joint work with Finale Joshi Velez's lab over at Harvard. She was a speaker here a couple years ago, and she does a lot of work also on machine learning for healthcare. And so this is an exactly the sort of domain where we'd really like to be able to get better predictors, and where the dynamics of the systems can be very complicated. So we recently um, published a paper on this work, which we call representation balancing. And the idea is that we're gonna be able to try to use our previous data, combine it with deep learning, and end up getting much better forms of models and predictors um, for how good these sort of alternative decision strategies will be. It allows us to sort of take models, which often can be very data efficient, um, and fit them in new ways so we can try to start answering these counterfactual questions. So just to summarize, I think the issue of sort of 
how do we do counterfactual sequential prediction is really exciting. And I think that it's an area that comes up in lots of different domains. It's something that people in um, economics and statistics um, and epidemiology have been thinking about for a while. But I think that as data scientists and machine learning people, we can also bring a whole new set of techniques and tools. And that it also offers up really exciting possibilities for what we can do when we can actually actively gather our data, which is something that we can do in a lot of the different forms of platforms today. So that's just one of the things that we're really excited about in my lab. Um, and I'm always delighted to talk to other people about potential collaborations. Thanks. <laughs>